Today we are doing Cambridge IGCSE Physics 0625-42 Feb March 2022 paper. Question number one. A ball rolls down a ramp and onto a horizontal surface. The first section of the horizontal surface is smooth. The second section of the horizontal surface is rough. Figure 1.1 shows a speed time graph for the ball. Part A says state the time when the ball reaches the start of the rough section of the horizontal surface. So we need to find the time where the ball reaches the rough section. So we can see the speed time graph here and we can draw a diagram here. So first the ball goes through a ramp. This is a ramp. And then the ball moves through smooth horizontal surface. So this is smooth horizontal surface. And then we have a rough horizontal surface here. Rough horizontal surface. Now when we place our ball here, you know that the ball will start increasing its velocity as moves down and then when it reaches the smooth horizontal surface the velocity of the ball is going to remain constant because there is no resultant force acting on the ball and when the ball reaches the rough horizontal surface the velocity is going to start decreasing because there is friction acting on the rough surface and we have a force so part A says we have to find the time when the ball reaches the rough surface. So as you can see here that the ball reaches the rough surface here according to our diagram. And before this the velocity of the ball remains constant. And if we look at our diagram we can see that here the velocity is constant. And after this the velocity starts decreasing. So the time we need is this time. If I find out the time here with this, it's gonna be 2.2 seconds. So we can write our answer here 2.2. Now moving on to part B. Part B says explain how figure 1.1 shows that there is no resultant force on the ball when it rolls along the smooth section of the horizontal surface. So what is the formula for um, resultant force? Resultant force is equal to ma. And how do you find acceleration from the speed time graph? It's the gradient of the line. And if you find the gradient of this line, it's going to be equal to zero. So we have acceleration as zero. Since acceleration is zero for this, what will happen is resultant force is going to be equal to zero. So we can write here the same point that the gradient is zero, gradient is zero, so acceleration is zero. And we can write our, our resultant force formula and then give them our equation into zero is gonna be equal to zero. So we'll get two marks for this. Part C says, using figure 1.1, determine the acceleration of the ball as it rolls down the ramp. So when it rolls down the ramp, um, the initial velocity of the ball is going to be zero because um, it's not moving at that time. And then we need the velocity of the ball at this point, which is going to be somewhere here. Which is 1.5. Okay, so we can use our formula, normal velocity formula, velocity and acceleration formula, which is going to be acceleration equals change in velocity divided by time. And if we see the time here, right, the time is this 1.5 seconds and our speed is over here, which is approximately 12.8 because this is 13. So we have our time as 1.5, time equals 1.5, and we have our final velocity which is going to be v2 equals 12.8, and we have our initial velocity which is equal to 0. 
so we can put our uh, values in so it's going to be final which is 12.8 minus initial which is 0 divided by 1.5 which is going to give us our answer as 12.8 minus 0 divided by 1.5 which is equal to 8.53 which is going to be recurring so we can write it as 8.50 so it's going to be 8.5 meters per second square don't forget to add the unit so uh, part d says the ball starts from rest at the top of the ramp show that the length of the ramp is this so we just found out the acceleration right we have the acceleration which is 8.5 we have the initial velocity which is u zero and we have the final velocity which is 12.8 and we need to find s so we can use our suvat equation which is v square equals u square plus 2 a s and you can see we have all the values except of s so we can plug in our values and find out the value of x so it's going to be 12.8 square minus 0 square then divided by 2 into acceleration which we found out which is 8.5 we can plug in our values and find out our answer so square divided by 2 into 8.5 which is going to be equal to 9.63 and we have proven our answer and we are done with the question question number two figure 2.1 shows a spring balance used to measure the weight of bb the spring inside the balance extends when a mass is suspended from it the dial shows the extension of spring as a value of mass in kg so we need to highlight this that the values are given in mass which is kg next it says that the spring obeys Hooke's law up to a weight of 175 newton part a i says state Hooke's law so you should have learned about this Hooke's law states that the extension of spring is going to be directly proportional to the weight applied on it so this is going to be our definition for one mark and then part two says state the relationship between the mass of the baby and the force exerted on the spring due to the baby so we know the formula that w equals mg right what is w w is f which is force and m and what is g g is acceleration so it's a according to this formula we can see that f is directly proportional to m because if you increase mass the force increases and if you decrease the mass the force decreases so we get one mark for this part 3 says the reading on the spring balance is 8 kg determine the force exerted on the spring due to the baby so we know the formula we found out in the first part which is f equals m a uh, we need to find f which is force m we have is 8 kg and then a is our gravitational value which is 10 so we can plug in our values f equals m is 8 and then a is 10 so we get our value as 80 so we write 80 here and don't forget the units part b says the limit of proportionality of the spring is at a force of 175 newton sketch the extension load graph for the spring the sketch must be continued beyond a force of 175 newton so according to Hooke's law, the extension of the spring is going to be directly proportional to the force applied. So we have our limit of proportionality here. So till here it's going to be a straight line. So we can draw a straight line here. 
till this point the extension is going to be directly proportional to the load applied on it so as this point exceeds what happens is the curve is going to be a little up like this there's going to be a curve moving upwards and what's the reason behind that um, according to our Hooke's law when we give one Newton of load the extension could be one centimeter okay and when the Hooke's law is not obeyed uh, maybe one Newton of load would give you two centimeter of extension that's why the curve is moving upwards and this is how we get two marks for this one for the straight line and one for the curve part c says that the baby is carried from the ground floor to the bedroom the vertical height of the bedroom above the ground is 3.5 uh, calculate the change in gravitational potential energy of the baby when it is carried from the ground floor to the bedroom so we know the formula of gravitational potential energy which is dpe um, and that formula is m g into change in height so we have mass which is 8 of the baby and then gravitational constant is 10 and then change in height will be final which is 3.5 minus initial which is 0 and we multiply them together to get our GPE, which is change in gravitational potential energy. So 8 into 10 into 3.5, which is going to give us 280. And don't forget to add your units, which is going to be joule. And we are done with question number 2. Question number 3. Figure 3.1 and 3.2 show how a puddle of water changes on a warm windy day. And you can see the illustration here. Part A says describe the process by which the volume of the water in the puddle decreases. So what happens is that you have a puddle here, right? And we have high energy molecules on top of the surface. And on warm windy day, in the question it says it's a warm windy day what happens is hot air molecules come and hit the water puddle and what happens is when they hit the high energy molecule the molecule has enough energy to escape the surface of the water so it escapes the surface of the water and now what happens is that this molecule is gone now eventually what happens is that like almost three fourths of the puddle is gone because they had enough energy to escape the surface of the water. So now what happens is that the puddle volume of the puddle decreases and we call this process evaporation. So the simplest answer you can write is that the water evaporates. Thus the volume decreases and we are talking about the water here okay and we can even mention that the high energy molecules escape the surface of the water and we'll get two marks for this part b says state and explain one change in the weather that would cause the volume of the water in the puddle to decrease more slowly so what can we do we know that the rate of evaporation is directly proportional to temperature so as we increase the temperature the rate of evaporation will increase and as we decrease the temperature the rate of evaporation decreases so we can write our answer here that cool weather because rate of evaporation decreases as temperature decreases and we get two marks for this so part c says explain in terms of molecules how sweating helps you to cool your body on a hot day so we have our tissue here right this let's say this is our tissue or skin you can say skin 
and we have high energy molecules on this because we are hot we are doing workout or anything and what happens is when you sweat you have like a drop of water here on on your skin this energy molecule will get absorbed by the water right so when it gets absorbed by the water the high energy molecule um, in the water will escape the surface of the water and eventually the volume of the water will decrease and what will happen is eventually you will cool down these all molecules will get absorbed by the water and they will escape the surface of the water so what happens is that thermal energy is transferred to the wa water and then because the water is hot it evaporates and your body cools down so we can write the simple explanation for this that thermal energy thermal energy from body is transferred to water and high energy molecules from the water surface escape from the surface and what happens because of this our body cools down so we can write here our body cools down or we can say that the temperature decreases decreases and we are done with question number three question number four but a says a sample of sand has a volume of this and the density of the sand is this the specific heat capacity of the sand is this but i says calculate the mass of the sand so um we are given with the volume which is this and we are given with the density which is this so we know the formula that density equals mass divided by volume and we need to find mass so we can rearrange our formula and we get our mass we have the values we can just plug in our values and find out the value so our mass is going to be equal to volume which is 0 0.050 into 1900 so we multiply this and we get our answer as 95 so we have our answer as 95 kg since mass is in kg part 2 says calculate the thermal capacity of sample of sand so how do you find thermal capacity you know that e equals m c delta t right and this part is thermal capacity we have m and we have c so we can find out our thermal capacity which is going to be m which is 95 into c which is going to be 1500 and we can find out our answer from here which is going to be 1.4 into 10 raised to power 5 1.4 into 10 raised to power 5 and we get two marks for this part 2 says the initial temperature of the sample of sand is this the sample of sand is heated using an electrical heater the power of the heating element is 50 watts calculate the time taken to increase the temperature of the sand to this so we have t1 which is 7 and we have T2 which is 19 and we are given with power which is 50 watts and we need to find time uh, note here this is temperature so we have the formula E equals MC delta T we can't find out time from this so we need to find out uh, another formula and equate them together so we have power equals energy divided by time as well we have energy and we have power so we can find out our time from here 
So what we do is we rearrange our formula, which is going to be time equals energy divided by power. And we can find out our energy from here. So we use our first part, which is 1.4 into 10 to the power 5, which is our capacity. 1.4 into 10 to the power 5 into the change in temperature, which is final, which is 19 minus initial, which is 7 divided by our power, which is 50. So we get our time. And we can find out the value, which is going to be 1.4 into 10 to the power 5 into the change in temperature. And then we divide by power. This is going to be 33600, zero, which is approximately equal to 34,000. And we can write our units as well which is seconds okay don't forget the units part b says in some countries the soil is too cold for plants to grow well in these countries plants are growing in plastic pots and kept inside the pots containing soil are placed on sand the sand is heated using an electrical heater um, but I say is described in terms of molecules how the thermal energy is transferred from the heated sand through the base of the plastic pot. So this we can illustrate. This is our sand. And we can say that this is our pot, plastic pot, here. When this rod gets heated, what will happen is through conduction the heat will pass on to the sun when the sun gets heated what will happen is the sun molecules will vibrate on small frequency right we can't notice it but they vibrate so because of the vibration this pot will also get heated there will be thermal energy transfer and we can write a simple statement for this which is going to be when heating element is turned on the energy thermal energy is transferred to sand through conduction and if you don't know what conduction is i have a simple diagram here which i'll just bring it down and you can see here that when you put a pot on electric stove or anything, the bottom of the pot will get heated and what will happen is the energy will get transferred through to this handle. So this is what um, conduction is in simple words. So we can write our one more statement because it's for two marks that um, sand molecules vibrate and collide with the plastic pot because of that there is thermal energy in the pot so we get two marks for this part 2 says the heating element in figure 4.1 remains switched on the temperature of the sand remains constant at a value above room temperature explain why the temperature of the sand remains constant so uh, we have the sand here and we have the heating element now uh, the energy is being transferred to the pot it's getting transferred to the pot so what will happen is it sees that the temperature of the sand remains constant right so when it remains constant that means the energy supply is going to be equal to the energy which is given out by the sun. So that's basic explanation. So we can write it in statements. The sand is warmer than the surrounding. And because of that, the heat will be transferred to the pot 
and now as the temperature is constant so we can write here energy lost by sand is going to be equal to energy gain by sand and we are done with question number four question number five a boy looks at the image of a clock in a plane mirror figure 5.1 shows the mirror the clock and the position of one of the boy's eye okay this is the eye this is the mirror and we have a clock here so um, part a i says that uh, on figure 5.1 draw a ray of light from the clock reflected to the boy's eye so what's gonna happen is there will be a line here which is gonna be line of reflection okay, which is this and then we have an line here which is inside the mirror plus we have one more line here which is going to be our incident line so our ray is going to go here and then hit the mirror and then go back to the boy's eye and our image is somewhere going to be formed in the mirror somewhere here so um, on figure 5.1 mark an x as the position of the image of the clock so make sure you keep the distance between these both the same this and this it, the distance should be same and you mark position of x over here okay and this is going to be our answer for part a i and a Part 3 says, state whether the image formed by the mirror is virtual or real. Explain your answer. So, we can write our answer here that the image cannot be projected. Cannot be projected. So, it's a virtual image. And we get one mark for that. Part 4 says, um, figure 5.2 shows the image of the clock seen by the boy. Now, the boy now looks directly at the clock. On figure 5.3, draw what the boy sees. So, uh, we know when we look in the mirror, you... Let's see. Here, this is a mirror. Now, if the object is positioned here, and the mirror is gonna be here on this side if you see from our perspective okay this is gonna be our left and this is gonna be our right but then when we see from the perspective of the mirror this is gonna be the left and this is gonna be the right so the image will be opposite or you can say it will be reflected so uh, we will have the same time and uh, the big side of the clock will be same and the small one will reflect on the other side so it's gonna be like this and we are done with this part we get one mark for that part B I say is the clock is illuminated by a source of monochromatic green light state the meaning of monochromatic so what monochromatic means is a light of single frequency E N C Y frequency. Part B2 says the green light has a wavelength of this. Okay, we got a wavelength. Calculate the frequency of green light. Okay, we are supposed to find frequency. We have the wavelength which is lambda which is equal to 5.6 into 10 raised power minus 7. We need to find frequency and we know the speed of the light which is 8.0 into 10 raised to the power 8 so which formula relates with this v equals f lambda we can plug in our values and make f as the subject to get the answer so we get v which is 0 3.0 into 10 raised to the power 8 divided by lambda which is 5.6 into 10 raised to the power minus 7 so it's going to be like this and we can use our calculator to find the answer into 10 raised to the power 8 divided by 5.6 into 10 raised to the power minus 7.
So we get our answer as 5.4 into 10 raised to the power 14. And we are done with question number 5. Question number 6. Figure 6.1 shows two magnet bars here which is north and here it's south. Um, part A says on, on figure 6.1 sketch the pattern and the direction of magnetic field lines between the bar of magnet. So we know that magnetic field goes from north to south right. So we can draw our lines here from north to south. It's a pretty straightforward question. And we can draw one line like this and one line like this to be secure. Okay. Part B says figure 6.2 shows the same bar magnets with a coil of wire between them. So this is same. And we obviously have a magnetic field from north to south. Uh, now part I says name the parts labeled A. These two and it's gonna be a um, slip ring committed slip ring we can just write slip ring you don't need to mention commutator so the difference between slip ring commutator and split ring commutator is that a split ring commutator has one um, gap in between and slip ring commutator usually have two round commutators around them so it's like this basically everything else is same we have two brush everything the experiment is same but the only thing is that this has gap in between so make sure you learn this before your exam and hopefully you'll get this okay part two says the coil of the wire is rotated in the direction shown at figure 6.2 you can see here the direction is shown like this like this and it says that on figure 6.2 draw an arrow to show the direction of the current in coil explain your answer so for this we have to use Fleming's left hand rule which is going to be like this and you have 90 degrees in between you're using your left hand of course I can't show it here but you have to use it here and this is going to be your thumb and this is going to be your index finger and this is going to be your middle finger so we know that this is F which is force B which is magnetic direction of magnetic field and I which is direction of the current so we know that this is going down and this is going up right because when you're rotating on this side what will happen is this will go up and this will go down we have the direction of force, we have direction of magnetic field, we can find I. So we have the magnetic field going from here till here. You can point your index finger um, from left to right. And you can point your force downwards. And you can see that the middle finger goes here into the paper so this is gonna be our direction of current just like this and of course for the opposite side it's gonna be like this and for explanation we can write is by using Fleming's left hand rule and rule force is downwards and we can just uh, mention some letters here like Q and S for current from Q to S so we'll get two marks for this one for the direction and one for explanation so part 3 says explain how rotating coil in figure 6.2 continuously causes the galvanometer needle to show an alternating current. So for alternating current what will happen is in the galvanometer it's gonna show like this. After each and every turn 
the meter is gonna show different reading after each and every 180 turn so uh, for example on the first turn it shows like this so on the second turn it's it's gonna show like this okay the opposite because it's an AC alternating current and because it's alternating current the direction of the current keeps on changing so that's why we get different readings every time for every 180 rotation so for this we can write our explanation here that the coil cuts magnetic field causing induced EMF so you know whenever magnetic field is cut there is an EMF produced okay. and we can write as that the current in coil is transferred to galvanometer and we can even mention the point that um, the direction of current changes every rotation for 180 degrees okay so um, for this what will happen is the galvanometer needle will show opposite reading the reading for galvanometer is gonna be opposite will be opposite and um, if you're wondering how does the current travel from the coil to the galvanometer you can see here that the direction of current is like this and then from here it travels from the coil to the galvanometer from here okay and when you change the direction for the other direction it's gonna be like this it will travel from here to the galvanometer so it's gonna be like this and the galvanometer reading will keep on changing and we are done with question number six question number seven figure 7.1 7 shows a circuit including a 12 voltage battery and two identical lamps um, part A says the 12 voltage battery consists of cells connected in series each cell has um, an electromotive force EMF of 1.5 volts determine how many cells are in the battery number of cells okay so all the total batteries have 12 volts right and we have for one we have 1.5 volts so we need to find n here we just rearrange our formula and we get as 12 divided by 1.5 which is gonna be our answer 8 so there are eight number of cells part B I says when the switch is closed the ammeter reading is 2.4 ampere calculate the total resistance of the circuit at this time we are given with the reading of I which is 2.4 ampere and note here they are saying that we need to find total resistance so we have to use our total voltage of the battery which is 12 so we have v which is 12 voltage and we need to find r so the only formula which relates with this is v equals i r and we have v which is 12 and i is 2.4 so we can find out r by rearranging our formula so we get our answer as 12 divided by 2.4 which is gonna be five so we have five and don't forget to add the units which is going to be ohms part two says each lamp has a resistance of 3.0 ohms calculate the resistance of q so we have two lamps here each of the lamp have 3.0 ohm resistance so to find the total combined resistance of this we have to use our formula which is given or uh, you have learned this formula before 
which is R1 into R2 divided by R1 plus R2. So in this case, R1 and R2 both are same. So we can find the combined resistance 3 into 3 divided by 3 plus 3, which is going to give us our answer as 1.5. Ohms and then you know that the total resistance is this so 5 minus 1.5 is gonna give us 5 minus 1.5 is gonna give us 3.5 so we have 3.5 ohms of resistance for Q here Part C, I says, on figure 7.1, draw the symbol for a voltmeter that measures the potential difference across two lamps. To measure um, voltage difference, the voltmeter should be connected in between the two lamps. So, part 2 says, calculate the power supply to one lamp. So, we know that the resistance of one lamp is going to be 3. Okay, so 3. And we know that I is equal to 1.2 and we are supposed to find P. So um, the only equation we can use here is P equals VI and then we know that V equals IR. So we can substitute our V here because we don't have our voltage. So P equals i square into r we have i we have r we can just substitute our values and get our answer which is gonna be 1.2 square into 3 which is gonna be equal to 4.32 and don't forget to add your units which is gonna be watts and we are done with question number seven question number eight a radio is connected to the main supply using a step down transformer but ac is draw a label diagram of the structure of a basic step down transformer so we can uh, draw the simple structure of a transformer which is going to be like this and we are going to have some coils rotating from here and as this is step down transformer the coils in secondary coil is gonna be less so we can label this as well this is gonna be iron core and this is gonna be our primary coil and this is gonna be our secondary coil so part B says uh, explain the operation of a basic transformer. These questions are usually repeated and you have to memorize the stuff. I can explain this in simple drawing. When you pass current from here, what happens is that this current interferes with the magnetic field of primary coil. As a result, what happens is that the magnetic field increases and interferes with the magnetic field of secondary coil hence what happens is induced emf on this side is produced and you get current on this side so we can just write down the explanation which is going to be current is passed through primary coil and magnetic field is created that magnetic field goes and interferes with the secondary um, coils magnetic field so we can write emf induced and interferes with the magnetic field of secondary coil Because of that, there is EMF in 
secondary coil. And you just have to write this for three marks. Part C says uh, the voltage of main supply is this. Uh, the output voltage of the transformer is this. Calculate the value of turns ratio, which is N number of turns in secondary divided by number of turns in primary. Give your answer to two significant figures. So we have the formula N S divided by N P equals V S divided by V P, right? So what is V S and V P? It's given in the question. So V P is this main supply, which is 230 and V S is 6. So we can just substitute our values and we can find the ratio. So V S is 6.0 divided by V P, which is given as 230. So we just put this in our calculator. And we get our answer as 0 0.026, correct to two significant figures. So it's going to be 0 0.026. And we are done with question number 8. Question number 9. Figure 9.1 shows a digital circuit. Um, this is a AND gate and this is a NOT gate. So we have inputs of A, B and we have two outputs which is C and D. So part A1 says explain what is meant by digital. So the meaning of digital is that the output uh, can only be 1 or 0. So we can write here output of 1 or 0 and we can write as only two possible outputs. Outputs. Okay. So this for this you'll get one mark. And part two says table nine point one is a truth table for the digital circuit shown in figure nine point one. Complete columns C and D. As you can see here, this is AND gate and this is NOT gate. So first we can do for C. So for C to be one, A and B both should be one we can see here that this is one both inputs are one so this is going to be one and rest of all is going to be zero and for d we can see that the input is only c and our gate is not so it's going to be opposite of c so we're just going to write the opposite of c which is going to be one 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 zero and we get two marks for this. Part B says state the single logic gate that would produce the same output D from the inputs A and B. So as you can see here, there's an AND gate and NOT gate. So it's going to be NAND gate, N-A-N-D, which is NOT AND. And we are done with question number 9. Question number 10. The isotope americium 241 is represented by this. The isotope decays by an alpha emission to an isotope of neptunium, which is NP. Part A says complete the nucleide equation for this decay. So alpha particle has four nucleon number. So this is our nucleon number, and we know that alpha has two protons. And now what we can do is just subtract our nucleon number to get nucleon number for NP. So we're going to get 241 minus 4 is going to be 237. And 95 minus 2 is going to be 93. And we get 3 marks for this. Part B says figure 10.1 shows a simple diagram of a smoke detector. The smoke detector contains a small sample of americium 241. Uh, this isotope ionizes the air between the metal plates in the detector. So part I says describe how americium 241 ionizes air. So we can see here that the reaction takes place as that 
americium decays and then releases alpha particle okay so what happens is that this decay will release alpha particle and that alpha particle will go and collide with air molecule and i can draw a structure here let's suppose this is air molecule and we have our um, electrons rotating it what will happen is that this alpha particle will come and hit this electron and when this hits the electron what will happen is the electron will go away and this air molecule is gonna get ionized because it doesn't have enough electrons to be stable so uh, now we can describe this in our own words so we can write as alpha particles are released from am which is americium and the alpha particle Heads alpha particle hits with air molecule moving the electron from molecule. So that's why what happens is um, the air molecule gets ionized. get ionized and we get three marks for this part two says suggest and explain two reasons why smoke detectors use an isotope that emits alpha particles rather than isotope that emits gamma radiation so we know that alpha particle can be stopped by smoke because they are least penetrating um, gamma ray can only be stopped by lead so it should be a lead something, a lead uh, wall or anything. So gamma particles are highly penetrating. So what happens is that they just pass through the air. So we can't use that. So we can write here alpha particle can be stopped by smoke because they are least penetrating and why do we use alpha particle is because we need to ionize the molecule air molecules and the second point we can write is that alpha particles are highly ionizing they're not highly penetrating but they're highly ionizing so that uh, they can make air molecules ionize. For this reaction, we need to make air molecules ionize. So alpha particle is the best candidate. Alpha particles are highly ionizing. So they can ionize air particles. And we get two marks for this. We are done with the paper. If you have any questions, comment down below. I'll respond to you as soon as possible. See you in the next video. Bye.